Uh, Lisa, uh, do we have people populating now? Uh, can you have it? You're up to about 500. Okay, why don't you uh, make sure, Lisa, we can see the uh, <laughs> All right. Well, friends, we're going to begin. And there's Dr. Warnock. Can you hear us, Dr. Warnock? You have to unmute. So we're going to begin. And uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. who's joining, we have quite a large group and uh, uh, we're, we're gonna wait just one more minute. Uh, there are uh, really literally almost a thousand people who have registered for this webinar. And uh, I think we will uh, begin. We're having some te technical difficulties with uh, Dr. Warnock, but I'm hoping that he will be able to uh, join us soon. I am here and I can finally hear. <laughs> Thank goodness. Praise the Lord. Uh, yes, so wonderful. <laughs> Dr. Warnock, it's, it's wonderful to have you here. I'm just going to begin with a few commercials and uh, hopefully uh, uh, Rabbi Berg and uh, Dr. Greenberg, you can all still see our uh, screen and our shared screen. So I'm going to begin. Uh, first of all, it really is a pleasure to uh, welcome all of you who've joined, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people who've joined this special webinar titled uh, Black Jewish Alliance Then and Now. And uh, my name is Gary Zola. I am the executive director of the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives, which is hosting, as you all know, this afternoon's special webinar. Now, uh, we have a very large registration for this particular webinar. So let me take a, a minute to say a word or two just about the American Jewish Archives. For those of you on this webinar who are joining the webinar of the American Jewish Archives for the very first time. The American Jewish Archives is located on the historic Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. The Hebrew Union College is our nation's oldest rabbinical seminary in continuous existence. And uh, the American Jewish Archives is a part of the college and is located uh, on the Cincinnati campus, as I said, and has been established since 1947 by the distinguished historian and pioneering scholar of American Jewish history, and now the namesake of the archives, Dr. Jacob Rader Marcus. Over the past 73 years, the American Jewish Archives has grown into what we believe to be the world's largest freestanding research center dedicated solely to the study of the American Jewish experience. Now, over the past decade, the Marcus Center has been offering the general public an array of educational webinars that have attracted Hebrew Union College alumni, and HUC benefactors, uh, lay leaders, and of course, all those who are interested in the American Jewish experience. And we consider these offerings another way uh, that we can fulfill our mandate, which we inherited from our founder, Dr. Marcus. And that, that mandate, of course, is to preserve and to promulgate the history of the Jewish experience in North America. Now, we're very grateful today, very grateful to our co-sponsors for this particular webinar. And uh, uh, they have helped in bringing this webinar to you. And that is the Temple in Atlanta and also the National Underground Railroad, Railroad Freedom Center here in Cincinnati. We're greatly appreciative of their partnership and their generous support. 
Now, friends, it's no exaggeration to say that the tragic and senseless murder of Mr. George Floyd on May 25th, 2020, launched a national reckoning. In the days that followed, a series of maddening and heartbreaking events have compelled all thinking and caring citizens to confront once again the seemingly implacable racism and the rising tide of hatred which can no longer be ignored. And it is no exaggeration to say that the Jewish community of America has been deeply stirred by all that has occurred. And there is in our community a genuine desire to listen and to learn and to act. Hatred and bigotry have been unfortunately the handmaiden of Jewish, of the Jewish historical experience. And our past teaches us that when a society has ingrained within it prejudice and bias, that society is an unjust society. And the foundational texts of our ethical heritage impel us to pursue justice. So this impulse that is to pursue righteousness and justice has prompted the American Jewish Archives to organize this webinar on this historic, on the historic and complex relationship between the Jewish community and the black community and the civil rights of American citizens here in America. Now, since the American Jewish Archives is responsible for preserving, for preserving the heritage of black Jewish relations in America, our webinar begins with a look to the past because history always provides us with a valuable perspective on current events. So the second half of our webinar will make use of that past as we engage in a valuable conversation which will touch upon the decisive and transforming events that confront us today. So let us begin. Just before I uh, introduce our special guest, our honored guest, let me quickly mention a few technical matters relating to the webinar itself. On your screen, you should be viewing our speakers and also the documents and photos which we'll be using during this afternoon's session. You should be seeing right now the emblem of the American Jewish Archive. Now you can change the balance on your screen, the size of the documents and the size of the speakers by moving the vertical line between the two to the right and to the left. It is true that the chat feature is on and we are watching the chat feature, but in light of the extremely large attendance today, it is almost a certainty that we will not be able to get to many questions. But please know that your questions will be harvested and we will forward them on to the speakers and we hope you will be receiving responses after the webinar. Now at the conclusion of this webinar, there'll be a few brief announcements. And when our webinar concludes, you'll be receiving tomorrow follow-up mailing so that you can remain, if you'd like, in touch with the American Jewish Archives. And you'll also be able to find a recording of this webinar and an array of special learning opportunities on the Hebrew Union College's special learning portal, which is huc.edu backslash online learning. And it will also be available on the webpage of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati. And now it is a pleasure to introduce our three honored guests. First, on your screen, you see Professor Cheryl Greenberg. Professor Greenberg is the Paul E. Rather Distinguished Professor of, um, of History at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, where she specializes in teaching African-American history, 
race, and ethnicity, and 20th century US history. Dr. Greenberg has written extensively on these topics, including a volume on Black Harlem during the Great Depression, and uh, she's also edited a volume on the Student Nonviolent, Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the SNCC. But the volumes we'll be drawing on greatly today, uh, I'm going to give her a shameless plug, and that is Troubling the Waters, Black-Jewish Relations in the American Century, which was published in 2006. This, as you'll soon see, uh, offered readers an insightful new conceptualization with regard to Jews and Blacks in America. And we'll be hearing more about this analysis in just a few minutes. And then on your screen, you also see my colleague and my friend, Rabbi Peter Berg. In July of 2008, Rabbi Berg assumed the historic pulpit of the temple in Atlanta, Georgia. And this congregation has been led by only five senior rabbis in the past 125 years. And since coming to Atlanta, Rabbi Berg has become one of the city's leading advocates for social change, working with a variety of advocacy groups on issues such as separation of church and state, the death penalty issues, civil rights, religious freedom, welfare reform, hate crimes, and issues relating to the environment. He serves on so many boards in Atlanta and is deeply involved in that community. In 2009, Rabbi Berg was inducted into the College of Preachers at Morehouse College, which is Dr. Warnock's alma mater. And recently, he's been appointed by the governor of Georgia to the Commission on the Holocaust. You should know that my colleague, Rabbi Berg in 2013 was uh, 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 credited with being one of the 50 most influential rabbis in America in both Newsweek and in the Daily Beast. And of course, I know that Rabbi Berg wants me to stress above all of these things that he is currently the vice chair of the American Jewish Archives B'nai Yaakov Council, which is a special group of alumni of the Hebrew Union College who support and do what they can to help the poor American Jewish archives. Finally, it is really an honor and a privilege to introduce to you on this webinar, uh, Dr. Warnock. Dr. Warnock uh, has, is serving as the senior pastor of the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church. I dare say it's probably the one church in all of North America that almost every American knows by name. Uh, that is the spiritual home of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Dr. Warnock was 35 years old when he assumed that pulpit in 2005, and that made him the youngest person ever to be called to the senior pastorate of Ebenezer Baptist. And since assuming that responsibility, the congregation has added 4,000 new members, which is enhancing the church's legacy of social activism and spiritual numerical growth. Now, Dr. Warnock, as I said, is a very proud and cum laude graduate of Morehouse College. Dr. Warnock, I've been to Morehouse. I've taught there. I'm, I'm so pleased to, 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 to be able to say that. And uh, since Dr. Warnock's uh, work and ministry is tied like Dr. King's to scholarship and to the life of the mind, Dr. Warnock went on to earn a doctorate from the Union Theological Seminary in New York, where he studied systematic theology. As all of you know, we've been watching CNN and the TV all yesterday. Dr. Warnock is involved in an array of community activities in Atlanta and has already committed decades of social activism. And for this activity, he's been recognized with having his footprints placed on the International Civil Rights Walk of Fame. Dr. Warnock, it's really a special honor and a privilege to have you with us today. So now, finally, let's begin. 
and I uh, want to ask uh, some questions of, to begin with, as I said, from uh, Dr. Greenberg. Let's go back into the past, Dr. Greenberg. You know, uh, many people on this webinar probably assume that uh, the relationship between the Jewish community and the Black community began uh, in the years after World War II, and that really there's been no connection between the community prior to that and that it was the civil rights era and under Dr. King, uh, the leadership of Dr. King that Jews and blacks worked together. But the truth is that the story is a much more complicated story than that. Uh, so help us to set the stage for the conversation between Dr. Warnock and Rabbi Berg. What would you say in summary is the history of a black Jewish coalition in the United States? Uh, thanks, on one foot, I assume you want my answer. Yes. Um, but before I say anything, I just wanna thank the American Jewish Archives, not only for sponsoring this program, but by providing access to such an incredible array of archival materials that let people like me do our work. So thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, I would say that the black Jewish relationship began in the early 20th century um, as Eastern European Jews and Southern African Americans both converged on Northern cities. And because of anti-Semitism and racism and xenophobia, uh, both groups were discriminated against, although obviously racism was harsher. Um, one of the ways I'm, uh, you see before you is were restrictive housing covenants in which uh, white homeowners agreed that they would not sell their property to either African Americans or Jews. Uh, and by the way, I want to emphasize that I'm speaking largely of Eastern European Jews, which I mentioned before, because there have always, while there have always been Jews of color, um, the leadership and virtually all of the constituents that they thought they were serving were white. So I just want to make that um, caveat. Uh, in any case, it's not surprising that in this kind of environment, both groups then organized to protect themselves and to fight discrimination, like the NAACP in the African American community or the American Jewish Committee uh, in the Jewish community. And they were aware of each other's struggles. There's lots of evidence of that, uh, which are really about the same issue. But when African American groups reached out to Jewish groups for aid, the Jews really hesitated. And they were quite explicit about the fact um, that they were, they were fearful of allying themselves with an even more vulnerable group than they were. And that, by the way, was true of all white ethnic groups uh, and minority groups. And the difference is that Jews, at least Northern Jews, I'll come back to that, moved. And that's really because of the rise of anti-Semitism and uh, the rise of Nazism and fascism in the 1930s uh, and the war that followed, because Jews realized that it was in their interest to create broad support against anti-Semitism and racism. And African American groups respond to this outreach. So, for example, we see here you see an ADL pamphlet, Anti Defamation League pamphlet, The Klan is a Threat Today. And what it reads, although you can't read it, is uh, that although there were lots, that although at the moment KKK actions were anti black, they were also anti Semitic. And if we didn't want them to then turn on the Jews, we had to fight it now. Uh, another example is uh, mutual efforts to call against um, bigotry, they held rallies. Uh, against racial and religious discrimination across the United States. And most interestingly, from our point of view, there was a call in this era for coalition, for strong coalition building and strong common cause. Uh, this is, next slide. Um, and one example of that, yes, uh, this is an African-American minister from Harlem who argues that our common destiny is, uh, lies in African-Americans and Jews working together. Now, I call this in my book, spacious self-interest, that it was important co uh, collaboration, but both sides clearly benefited from it. So for example, there's an African-American case that, that eventually the Supreme Court ruled um, housing, uh, restrictive housing covenants unenforceable. So Jews benefited from that African-American case. Other white groups really did not make common cause even in this era they saw their self-interest as integrating as strongly as they could into the white community. Uh, so Jews were, were unusual in that, in that way. And after the war, 
uh, is when the, the period you're referring to really is when these relationships broadened uh, and African-American and Jewish groups broadened their interest beyond direct self-interest and began to work on each other's issues even when they were unrelated to their own plight. So for example, Jewish organizations filed briefs, amicus briefs um, for anti-segregation cases even before Brown versus Board of Ed. That the next, just so you can see the amicus there brief. Are. There you are. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Uh, on the other side, uh, an example is the NAACP, which lobbied UN delegates from Haiti and the Philippines to support um, the creation of Israel. So this is really the heyday of of collaboration, a deep engagement uh, with each other's struggles, and we know a lot about that. There were protests, next slide, uh, and demonstrating and picketing. There was, mar there was marching. Here we have a, the iconic photo of um, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marching with um, King and Abernathy, and of course, uh, even dying together uh, during the dangerous work of organizing. And that, of course, is um, Goodwin, Schwerner, and Cheney, an African-American and two Jewish Americans. And they had incredible successes. Uh, there's no question about it. Together, this coalition with others, of course, desegregated pools and housing and professional organizations and bowling leagues and stores and hospitals. You get the idea. That's the, really the moment that people focus on when they talk about the Black-Jewish relationship. Well, you know, uh, most of us also know, thank you, first of all, for, you know, summarizing uh, a tremendous amount of history and pointing out to us, uh, Dr. Greenberg, uh, the whole concept of coalition building and how uh, the relationship really could be better understood by taking note of the fact that uh, it, it, it's in mutual interest that we've been drawn together and in uh, uh, times when uh, uh, we didn't have mutual interest, the relationship becomes more complex. And that's what I wanted to get into now, because very often we know that since the death of Dr. King, uh, the so-called alliance, the Black Jewish uh, coalition that you're speaking about seems to have had a lot of bumps and uh, ups and downs, points of disagreement. So can you explain to the uh, listeners what happened? Uh, what was it that caused the coalition to have these vicissitudes since uh, the death of Dr. King? Um, another good question. I can't answer on one foot, but I'll try. Um, there are several reasons. Almost all of them have to do with race and class. And they go back to well before the death, of course, of uh, Martin Luther King. First of all, I just remind you all that um, the Jewish community is not monolithic. So to take Southern Jews, for example, they were terrified that local white folks who beat protesters uh, might then turn on Jews. And there's some justification for this, including the bombing of Rabbi Berg's temple in uh, Atlanta, which you'll hear more about uh, later. And many racists, many of these racists were also anti-Semites. So Southern Jews actually begged Northern Jews not to come South and not to demonstrate. And they warned against Martin Luther King and others as radicals. Uh, a second example of lack of monolithic uh, Judaism is that it's mostly reform, some conservative and secular Jews who make up the, um, the Jewish participation in the civil rights movement. So in other words, this collaboration, impressive as it was, was not based on an, an universal Jewish commitment so much as a political one. Uh, the second reason I think it uh, struggled was that white European Jews, who are the folks I'm talking about, uh, who are again the Jewish leadership, identified themselves as fellow victims with African Americans, uh, as I said before, and they didn't identify as white people. After all, white people in Europe had tried to kill us, them. Uh, and so they didn't recognize that or address the benefits uh, that they got from actually being white in the United States. So to take an example, the, the slide you see in front of you, um, Jews saw themselves as fellow strugglers, near poor, non-racist, because after all they, unlike most white people, had stores in black communities. Um, but African-Americans instead saw them as white people, 
who were economic insiders who exploited black outsiders by charging higher prices or by refusing to hire them as clerks. So this don't buy where you can't work campaign that you see, uh, this leaflet from the 1930s targets a white store owner, but to Jews who don't recognize themselves as white people, it seems like anti-Semitism. And this blindness to what we now call white privilege also led to an unintentional, I think, paternalistic or patronizing view. We made it, why can't you? Which of course I'm oversimplifying, but again, look at this pamphlet on racial tolerance. This pamphlet advocates for the hiring of African-Americans, which is wonderful, but notice who is the boss and who is the employee. So in other words, the same sense that brought African-Americans and white Jews together, a recognition of their vulnerability and oppression, a sense of their shared victimhood, uh, also blinded Jews to the differences between the two groups. And the fact that in the United States, at least, Jews were not victims in the same way, but instead were part of an oppressive system against black people. In other words, they ignored race as a fundamental structure, uh, structural factor in providing white Jews with benefits. And that led to a lot of resentment and misunderstanding between the two groups as Jews advocated for a slower reform process and a growing distrust of what they saw as impatient black social radicalism. So some turned to neoconservatism. Uh, others embraced instead a liberalism that they called race blind, the belief that justice could only be served if race became irrelevant. African Americans, of course, recognized that so long as our institutional structures were racist, pretending that race didn't exist or was irrelevant, merely cemented the unequal structures as they were. So, for example, during the affirmative action cases of the 1970s, uh, for the first time, African American and Jewish American civil rights organizations took positions on opposite sides. The first public split between African American and Jewish American organizations. Uh, oh. um, so many African American activists concluded that whites, including Jews, uh, were unreliable partners. And so they advocated for a more nationalist position, which Jews in turn then resented. Obviously the story is more complicated than this, but these frustrations and resentments and misunderstandings that had really been there all along exploded in the 1970s. And it seemed like a great coalition had ended along with liberalism itself, as you suggested. But I do wanna emphasize that black Jewish collaboration, cooperation and mutual concern didn't in fact end. So for example, uh, into the 1970s, the two chairs of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights were Arnold Aronson, a Jew, and Roy Wilkins, an African-American. And when some African-American groups castigated Israel for its treatment of the Palestinians, other African-American leaders took out full-page ads in the New York Times to emphasize their support for the Jewish state. At the same time, groups both national and local still cooperated on legal civil rights efforts, on anti-poverty and other programs, aid to education, things like that. But it wasn't just a black Jewish coalition and it was not the sort of thing that generally generated headlines. So we don't see it. Uh, and finally, I just wanna say the collaboration has been uh, increased, uh, has continued throughout the years in protests as black and Jewish and other and black Jewish uh, activists protested discrimination and ethnic violence wherever they saw it. Well, thank you so very much. Uh, I think what I'd like to do now is, uh, I wanna, since I, I'm watching the time, I think what I'd like to do is, is now bring in uh, 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 Dr. Warnock and, and Rabbi Berg. And uh, I, I wanna, ask the two of you to unmute and Dr. Greenberg, you join in here because I might ask you our last question uh, at that point. But uh, one of the uh, last points you made, Dr. Greenberg, is that uh, you spoke about the uh, continuing coalitions that uh, have existed. And uh, that really brings us to uh, our next two guests. And uh, I, I think uh, I'd like to start with both of you, uh, if you don't mind, since uh, our tradition teaches us that you're supposed to talk about a holiday when the holiday is occurring. And uh, 
the point of that teaching is uh, that you shouldn't overlook timely issues when you need to. And I know that you, Dr. Warnock, uh, and you, Rabbi Berg, yesterday uh, played an important role in, uh, in our nation's history uh, when you officiated uh, Dr. Warnock Rabbi, uh, and Rabbi Berg. I know you were there at Rayshard Brooks' funeral. Uh, I wondered if you could begin by just talking. Terrence, turn the air on. Talking of the two of you about uh, 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 this experience, and uh, then we'll go on to some of the other topics of today. Uh, maybe Rabbi Berg, you go first. You know, you were a guest there, and then uh, we'll, Dr. Warnock, you can uh, follow. Uh, thank you. It's uh, great to be here today, and I, you know, I just want to. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Dr. Zola, for this opportunity. Uh, uh, and our movement plays such a, a proud history in, in all of this. That was uh, the picture that we saw, of course, earlier. Uh, the, the person holding the Torah was Rabbi Eisendrath of then the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. Right. And our Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism uh, uh, under Rabbi Saperstein and Rabbi Pesner's leadership is at the center um, of all that, that we are talking about. Um, yesterday uh, was one of the most difficult and, and, and moving experiences um, uh, of my life. Um, it was an honor, uh, 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 Reverend Warnock, uh, to be with you on, on the pulpit of Ebenezer yesterday. Um, um, and to be a part of to be a part of history and to say what absolutely uh, needed to be said, and um, uh, for those of you who haven't seen Rabbi uh, Reverend Warnock's, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we call each other. I, I always say that he's he's my Reverend and he says he's my Rabbi. So I'm, that was a Freudian slip. Uh, but uh, if you haven't seen his uh, eulogy yesterday, um, I think that will go down in history as one of the most prophetic eulogies. Um, ever delivered. Um, it, it is such an important message for people to hear. Um, and, um, and it was so important for the Jewish community to be, to be a part of that experience yesterday. Uh, very, very difficult. Dr. Warnock, please join us. We're uh, so eager to hear what you have to say. And again, honored to have you with us on this uh, particular uh, webinar. Well, I'm deeply honored to be here. And I want to thank my dear friend and brother, uh, Rabbi Berg, uh, for reaching out. I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of this conversation. It's such a vital and important conversation in this moment uh, in our nation's history. Uh, the seeds of hatred and racism, anti-Semitism and bigotry uh, are being planted and the flames of this ugliness are being fanned, uh, in my view, uh, uh, by those in, in the highest forms of leadership in our country with deep, deep implications for our children. Uh, once you open that, that bottle, as, as both of our communities know, it's not, you can't, it, 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 you, you, you can't sort of suddenly stop it. And it's, it, hate is a dangerous thing to play with. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here in this moment. I did have the sad duty yesterday of eulogizing Mr. Rayshard Brooks. And uh, I was grateful to have Rabbi Berg there with me. Uh, this is an inflection point in our country. Uh, it's a moment when, when we've come to two roads and we get to decide again, as we've had to decide at other junctures, um, whether we will be a more inclusive and just society for everybody. And uh, the story of Rayshard Brooks is just the latest high profile uh, chapter in an ongoing narrative, a struggle for, for justice, and I think for the soul of the country. Uh, so I'm grateful uh, for our work and our connection. Rabbi Berg and I have been working on this issue together now for a few years, and we're happy, you know, you, we're, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that whenever in this conversation you'd like for us to talk about it. But part of what I argued yesterday in my eulogy and, and what I've been saying to the media is that the focus on police brutality is, is correct, but this is much larger than police brutality. Police brutality is uh, a consequence of a more basic public policy uh, decision in our country, and that's mass incarceration. 
And mass incarceration is the latest iteration of the ongoing narrative of what I call COVID-1619, when 20 some Africans arrived on the shores of Jamestown, Virginia as slaves. Uh, it, it expressed itself, this virus first as chattel slavery. And we thought that we had defeated it in the bloody conflict of the Civil War. And it did go into remission for just a few years, something called reconstruction. And during that time, you had black leadership at the highest forms of government in our country. But it came back in a, with a vengeance and Jim Crow segregation. And now the new Jim Crow, as Michelle Alexander calls it, mass incarceration in the age of color blindness, in which the land of the free has become the mass incarceration capital of the world. It is a prison industrial complex, privatized, a beast that consumes black bodies and brown children on both sides of the border. And we have to decide to defeat that. The police brutality is as predictable as it is brutal. Uh, it is a part of that larger system and I'm grateful that we have a multiracial coalition of conscience pushing back in a moment like this. Yeah, I was I was very touched, uh, Dr. Warnock. I watched your uh, your eulogy on YouTube, and uh, you you described uh, the matter of police brutality. I believe, in in a sense, as uh, 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 the feature of of having to feed the system of mass incarceration. It's all part of it. And I, I we listened to that carefully. Uh, you know, I want to take just two minutes uh, at this point. Uh, I, I want to get into the questions that you just raised, uh, uh, Reverend, but I, I'd like Dr. Uh, Rabbi Berg to uh, say a few words about the historic relationship between Ebenezer Baptist and the temple in Atlanta, because that's what that's what our place is in terms of of uh, this uh, conversation. That is history, and uh, I always like to recite what my teacher, Dr. Marcus, used to say: that history should give us perspective on the present. That's why we we study it. And so, uh, uh, Rabbi Berg, give us a a little history. I I want to show everybody these. This is the interior of both of these historic pulpits. Uh, uh, the top picture is uh, the temple, and it looks just like that. It, it, I want to tell the, those who are on the webinar that it's the only uh, building I've ever seen in all of the world where the eternal light drops down out of the ceiling right out of the wings of the American eagle. So when you're looking at the uh, eternal light hanging there and, and, and look up above, you see the American eagle. Uh, below, of course, is the historic uh, 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 sanctuary of Ebenezer. Uh, Rabbi, go ahead and uh, let's uh, start with this uh, event that uh, Dr. Greenberg talked about and tell us a little about it. Absolutely. And a, a, sh a shameless plug for the B'nai Yaakov Council. So grateful for the uh, American J Jewish Archives for housing these incredible documents uh, that preserve, preserve our history. Uh, I'll do this part quickly because most people are familiar. Uh, this is a picture from the Southern Israelite, uh, the Jewish newspaper that, uh, that features the temple bombing uh, that happened in 1958 because of Rabbi Rothschild's outspoken position on racial justice and integration. Uh, the, the congregation was bombed by white supremacists. Um, nobody was heard at the time. Uh, Rabbi Rothschild continued uh, to speak out forcefully, and you can see this here in his uh, sermon address. The bombing was on a Sunday morning, so the following Friday night, he gave uh, an iconic sermon, and none shall make them afraid, uh, which really brought in many ways the Atlanta uh, community together. Uh, I think a, a story that's less known, uh, but, but equally important, if not more important, is the story of the 1964. Uh, uh, Dr. King was, of course, awarded the uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize. And the city of Atlanta had to decide uh, how it wanted to honor Dr. King because he's our own. And uh, uh, it did not go so well. The conversations did not go well. The city did not uh, the business community necessarily want to honor Dr. King. Uh, and so Rabbi Rothschild and some ministers got together uh, and went to the largest company then and now, Coca-Cola. And of course, Coca-Cola said to the business community, um, uh, we would like to honor Dr. King. Uh, would you like us to stay in Atlanta? 15 minutes later, 
uh, the dinner was organized and it was the first integrated dinner in the city at the Dinkler Plaza Hotel. Um, and if you uh, turn to the next page, you can see that Rabbi Rothschild uh, gave the invocation at this first uh, 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 dinner. Um, uh, so it's the first integrated dinner where, and, and Atlanta had the chance to honor Dr. King. Uh, and it was really an, an example of the kind of work that Rabbi Rothschild um, and uh, fellow ministers did uh, at the time. The, the, uh, is there a picture of, uh, so you, you can see here too, of course, relationships matter. And uh, here you see uh, Rabbi Rothschild and Janice, uh, and of course the Kings. Um, uh, Coretta Scott King and Dr. Martin Luther King, and they were friends and uh, had a social relationship. Uh, the, the picture underneath is the picture of the gift that Do uh, Rabbi Rothschild presented to Dr. King on behalf of the city uh, for receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. All of that is part of the early part of our history. But the history uh, grew from the, the civil rights movement to uh, a Black Jewish alliance or coalition um, in 1982. And I don't know of another city that has a Black Jewish coalition that has lasted so long with so much interaction and with so many programs. In 1982, uh, the, the gathering was centered around the passage of the renewal of the uh, Voting Rights Act. And the guest speaker at that time was then city councilman John Lewis. Uh, so this coalition had uh, some important people in the city, US Senators Nunn and Mattingly, uh, clergy, business leaders, uh, but uh, most importantly, the editorial uh, board of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution was part of this early Black Jewish coalition. And they ho helped to push for this renewal, focusing on education and advocacy. Uh, the meetings took place mostly at the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change. Um, and some of the highlights included uh, the, the Black community and Jewish community walking together across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, with John Lewis in 1985, opposing the voter ID bill in, 19, in 2005. Uh, so that exists undiminished to this day. And I think in many ways, uh, Reverend Warnock and I are the, the next generation, the third uh, iteration of, of the, the Black Jewish Alliance uh, here in Atlanta. And uh, what it means is we're there for each other. Uh, as friends and as colleagues. And um, Raphael, how many times have we called each other to say, need you to come for a, for a press conference in 10 minutes? Um, and, um, uh, and we do it, we do, we do it for each other and we, we stand up for each other um, and we're there for each other. Uh, and and um, I think that that's really important. Um, and, uh, you know, just worked on this hate crimes bill, all, uh, all of us together with our colleague, Kevin Muriel of the historic Cascade United Methodist Church. Uh, the hate crimes bill passed yesterday. Uh, we were, there's now only three states that don't have a hate crimes bill. Um, and uh, there was a provision in that bill uh, two days ago that um, was not good um, uh, for the African-American community here and uh, the Jewish community across the board, synagogues, uh, organizations stood strong to say, we will not support that bill um, and, and a better bill passed. Uh, and that's the kind of work that we do every day. You know, I'd like to bring in Dr. Warnock to now to talk about something that uh, I've heard him speak about. You know, he, in full disclosure, he and I have not met personally, but you have a VIP invitation to come to Cincinnati and see the American Jewish Archives yourself, Dr. Warnock. I'd, but, I'd be deeply honored. But, but I've heard you speak about something, and, and here I want to, in a way, bring all of you together. Uh, 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 but first, Dr. Warnock, it, because the question I was going to ask Dr. Greenberg, but, but I wanted to get into uh, 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 the two of you, uh, had to do with this whole topic of racism as a, as a national issue versus anti-Semitism. Uh, there are people in the Jewish community who, uh, who, who feel that we have a rising tide of anti-Semitism. And uh, now, of course, uh, there's a great deal of focus, as it should be, on the terrible uh, ingrained racism systemically in our nation. And uh, wanted to have uh, Dr. Greenberg talk a little bit about that uh, balance. But I've heard you speak, uh, Dr. Warnock, about the fact that you see all of these hatreds, in a sense, coming out of, if I'm not mistaken, of, of the whole issue of white supremacy. And, uh, and uh, that, that uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, if you would, and give us your views on that. 
Well, uh, to, to put it succinctly, there, there's no such thing as equal rights for some. Um, I just think that it's so critically important um, that all of us find ways um, to, to stand up for one another, as, as Rabbi Berg put it, um, to see uh, the flourishing of our own community as inextricably connected to other communities and to learn from those experiences. Um, you know, in, in more recent times, and Dr. Dr. Greenberg knows it, in, in these academic circles, I think they call that intersectionality, we all these terms we come up with, right? But it, uh, that's been a part of my own evolution. I'll tell you that as a, as a thinking person, as someone who's tried to, to, to be morally wise, is the recognition that uh, even your ability to push up, to push against bigotry is expanded the more you engage others who come from an experience other than yours that all of us have blind spots. And that's part of what I said yesterday in the eulogy. And uh, I lifted up that text in Ezekiel where he says, I sat where they sat. And I just think it's important for us to sit where other people sit. Uh, because all of these forms of bigotry, they're over, they, they overlap uh, and their similarities and their differences. And it's complicated. Uh, racism is, 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 is a thing, anti-Semitism is a thing, both evil. And there's some ways in which those things overlap, there are ways in which they're different. There are ways in which they appear differently depending on who's making the, the argument. Um, but I do think it's important for us to engage all of these things because, I mean, we're witnessing in real time the ways in which demagogues seek to make use of the fissures uh, between us and people's particularly oppressed and marginalized people's worst stereotypes and assumptions about one another. They leverage those uh, in order to put forward the politics of division because they don't have a vision. And the more we engage other people, we get a broader view of what uh, justice actually looks like. Uh, what equality actually looks like. Men don't really know what uh, justice looks like until they talk to women. We think we're not sexist until we spend 15 minutes talking to women. <laughs> and uh, uh, white people are gonna have some blind spots and that's why you gotta engage people of color. And people of color are gonna have some blind spots and so you need to engage this issue of anti-Semitism. Oh, and in and, and a and real sense, finally for me, that's really the great story of America. It, it has been this expanding of this great and grand idea, the contours of which the folks who said it initially clearly didn't fully grasp it. Thomas Jefferson said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, grand and noble. Uh, you couldn't have better language. And yet he was a slaveholder. And, you know, but today across from the mall is a black man with his arms folded, literally looking at Thomas Jefferson as if to say, did you mean what you said when you said what you said? Uh, but he too had his own blind spots and they've been expanded by the concerns raised by women, by the concerns raised by the LGBTQ community, by disabled folks. And, and um, uh, fi finally, you be careful when preachers say finally, uh, whether or not they actually mean it. Um, you know, I, I think about, about the, the text that uh, Dr. King used to love to lift up, I, I guess from Isaiah, uh, every, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill made low, the rough places plain, the crooked places straight. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. And I used to think that the glory of God is so great that when it shows up, everybody will have to see it. All flesh will see it together. Of late, I've been thinking that it's actually the reverse, that what God is saying to us is that in order to see the glory of God, in order to see the contours of God's dream for humanity, we have to actually get together because we all have blind spots. We have to get together 
in order to see it. That's a, really a beautiful message, really. Uh, and I, I, I want to hear, uh, please, Rabbi Berg, Dr. Greenberg, as we're drawing towards the hour, uh, we may run a, a bit late because uh, uh, we got a minute or two late we, when we started. But uh, Rabbi Berg uh, uh, and Dr. Greenberg, please, if you'd like to respond. You, Rabbi Berg, you have to turn your mute off. Uh, I uh, resonate very much with those comments. And I, I really do believe at the end of the day, white supremacy is the common uh, threat of all people of conscience. It's an ideology of xenophobia and nationalism and, and it's mixed in with violence. And we saw it in Charlottesville in 2017, the Unite the Right rally was anti-Semitic saying Jews will not replace us. And it was anti-Black where a Confederate monument was at the focal point. Um, and we know that white supremacists are also anti-Muslim and anti-Jewish and anti-immigrant. And, um, and uh, what we've started to recognize, I think, is that white supremacy has moved from the fringes closer to the mainstream. And that has become very, very scary. It's normalized in our current culture. Uh, so we're starting to do work in Atlanta and about to, to release a series of programs on white supremacy 101, the history of the Klan in Atlanta, how the Nazis borrowed from Jim Crow, um, all the you know all of these important issues because we believe that white supremacy is at the heart of of all of everything that that's wrong in the world and an ideology that's only inclusive of bigotry uh, and of, uh, uh, um, means that we we have to speak out and speak strong. Um, and that's where I think this black Jewish coalition um, is so strong. And I think for those who are uh, thinking about starting a coalition in your own communities, th th I think this is the place to start. And the, the, the most important thing I think that I'll say is that it's not just white supremacy, it's white nationalism, right? As they say in The Wizard of Oz, she's worse than her sister. White supremacy uh, in the United States is a system designed to maintain control over people of color and the sexuality and reproductive rights of women, et cetera. But white nationalism is a social movement and uh, advancing a mass culture narrative that is singularly focused on the creation of a white ethno state. And we need to be focused on, on both of them. Uh, uh, when people ask me, what are you doing to, to fight anti-Semitism? I say the first thing we have to do is talk about white supremacy and white nationalism. Dr. Greenberg? Um, well, briefly, I want to underscore what, what um, you both said, that what's really important from a Jewish point of view is to remember that um, we have a history of oppression that makes us particularly sensitive to other oppressions. And also that we know, and we've seen exactly as you've cited, um, that the reality is that if, no, if anyone is not safe, then Jews aren't safe. Um, and so we need to come back to that sense of political engagement and recognition. On the other hand, and this is speaking primarily to a Jewish, the Jews in the audience, since this is the American Jewish uh, uh, archives, um, we have to remember that there are significant differences. And when Jews come to the table as activists, it seems to me that we have to remember some things. For example, that anti-Semitism, as terrifying as it is for Jews, is not the existentially threatening uh, danger as it is, as racism is and xenophobia. People don't shoot Jewish joggers. Uh, police don't strangle Jews uh, who are in custody and we never think about uh, driving while Jewish. So again, if, the commun if communities of color are prioritizing race at this point, we need to understand why. And we need to understand uh, that it's important both to do our part because we are both politically and morally obliged, um, historically obliged, um, but also because uh, uh, we have to, but also we have to be careful, sorry, um, of the limitations of that alliance. We have to recognize uh, that Jews are not subject to, most Jews are not subject to the same restrictions that race are, uh, and we have to confront that head on and avoid some of the fraction uh, of the factionalism and fracture that happened in the 1960s and 70s. Well, we're, we're already at two, and I, I want to say a word or two by wrapping up, but let me give both uh, Rabbi Berg and finally Rab, uh, Reverend Warnock um, uh, uh, what, what you might uh, say would be your concluding thoughts for this very wonderful conversation, which we would like 
to go on and on, but we can't because everybody has a tight schedule. But uh, first, Rabbi Berg, and then we're going to give you the uh, what what we uh, call at the Hebrew Union College, uh, Doctor, uh, the Sakadaliger, the uh, <laughs> the final word. So, uh, 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 Rabbi Berg, turn on your mic, and we're, we'll listen to you first. Your mic. I, I want to thank my friend, uh, Reverend Warnock, who uh, not only is leading Ebenezer Baptist Church, but uh, also running for United States Senate. Uh, so he, he is a, bu a busy person. So we're, we're grateful for your time. Um, uh, the two things I just want to say um, uh, in summation, um, first is um, something that, that, I, that has changed in this conversation over the years is that we are blessed to have so many Jews of color in our congregations in North America. And um, uh, they are in many ways helping to shape uh, the conversation and, and so grateful for that and uh, for the partnership that, that we're able to do um, with our wonderful di diverse reform communities. Secondly, I just uh, want to say that the issue that Reverend Warnock spoke about at the beginning, um, uh, and we should be marching, and I hope everybody's still marching, but um, uh, it's not just marching. Um, there, there are specific um, actions that need to be taken to make the world a better place. Uh, and, and the two of us um, have rolled up our sleeves to do record restriction work. We've held multiple uh, uh, record restriction expungement uh, summits in our con both congregations. And also this work of ending mass incarceration where the United States is, as you said, is the worst uh, uh, and, and Georgia happens to be the worst in America. And um, you can all learn more about that work uh, that, that we have um, doubled down on at endingmassincarceration.com, www.endingmassincarceration.com. And we have uh, there a, a full array of uh, programs and event about uh, speaking and preaching and teaching um, about this important work. Um, and uh, Reverend Warnock, look forward to all that is still yet to come um, uh, in the years ahead. Reverend Warnock, please. Thank you so very much. And I want to once again thank the American Jewish Archives for this invitation, uh, the Jacob Rader Marcus Center. And grateful to be here with all of you. Um, and um, uh, the, the work that uh, uh, Rabbi Berg is speaking of is real. And I, I think that we need to have the conversations. But in my experience, I also think that some of this gets worked out, the challenges, the differences, the, where there may be daylight between us. If, if you start, if you roll up your sleeve and actually do some work together, while you're at that, doing the work, I think some of these things you begin uh, to figure out and work through. And so we're really proud of this movement and the work we're doing around endingmassincarceration.com. I wanna lift up that website again because uh, the Temple and Ebenezer, along with other partners, almost a year ago this week, uh, a year ago Father's Day, organized a multiracial, multi-faith conference focused on ending mass incarceration, where we highlighted our work around uh, record restriction events. And these are people who have a record and they don't have a record. What do you mean, Reverend? They, they don't have a conviction. They've just been arrested. And their whole lives have been arrested. And turned upside down because they had an arrest 15 years ago, 20 years ago, never been convicted, in some cases acquitted. But the tentacles of this massive system literally are strangling people to death. It's not just Eric Garner, it's not just George Floyd. There are a whole lot of people who just can't breathe. And um, so we've been engaged in this work. I was very proud that at our conference, it was about half people of color and half white people uh, at the conference. And so we're continuing to do this work. I hope you'll join us. Finally, uh, let me say that there's a reason I do this work and why I'm so focused on it. It's because I, I, I in my work, have had a chance to work with a lot of people who are dealing with this issue. But I, I wanna close by saying it's deeply personal. You probably have noticed that I'm on, your, on the webinar and I'm in a car and this was scheduled, scheduled way in advance. And I want you to know it's not because I, I you know, took this lightly. I'm, it's because I really wanted to be a part of this no matter what. I have a brother who was sentenced to life in federal prison 
life without the possibility of parole. He was a first time offender convicted of uh, a nonviolent drug related offense in which no one got hurt, no one died, no one even got high because the federal government basically created the sting operation that they created. And for that, he was sentenced to life without parole. And we've been working hard for years. This is now his 22nd year to get him out through various appeals. And so far, we have not succeeded. We were dealing with the pandemic of racism. But then, interestingly, this other pandemic beset our nation now in recent months, and it's created all kinds of conditions, mostly completely terrible. I'm in a car because this morning at 8 a.m., because of COVID-19, ironically, my brother who went to prison when he was 33 and is now 55, Peter doesn't even know this. I'm in a car because I'm returning from Jessup, Georgia, where he was released this morning at 8 a.m. And after I did that funeral, ironically for Rayshard Brooks, who's caught up in the same system and lost his life running, whatever you think about his decision or his liberty, after that funeral, I got in a car last night and made my and drove four hours down to Savannah, Georgia, and then to Jessup. And uh, my brother walked out of prison this morning, and I had to get back to Atlanta, and I wanted to be here on this webinar with you, and um, say to you in in honor of him and so many, let's keep doing this work together. Wow, uh, I don't know uh, how to even begin to follow through on a comment following that. The only thing that comes to mind, uh, Reverend, is uh, that's what we're all about at the American Jewish Archives. It's making history. And uh, I think uh, it's fair to say we've just made history. Uh, and we want you to know how happy we are for your family and for you and for your brother. And so, very pleased that you felt comfortable enough and willing to share that brand new news right here with us very before anybody else. And we're grateful. I guess I, in ending, I, I, another idea came to my mind and, and I'm gonna draw this to an end, but when you come to the American Jewish Archives, uh, Reverend Warnock, you know, uh, the great collection on Dr. King, of course, is in Atlanta at the King Center. But believe it or not, there are a few things that we have at the American Jewish Archives that they don't have. And one of the items we have is we have a whole array of uh, Dr. King's addresses to synagogues. Mm -hmm. Because in the 1950s and 60s, he visited synagogues and he spoke and he preached in those synagogues. And in one of the recordings I'd love to play for you, Dr. King says something I'd like to leave us with. He says, I want you all to be maladjusted. Right. And, and I think that that he knew would resonate with the Jewish community because Jews are often countercultural in the way they live and in the way they practice. And I think Dr. King was calling them to be true to their heritage, not to accept that which is given to them, but to question it. And uh, I think your questioning over the past so many years and your work and, and Rabbi Berg's work, and of course, Dr. Greenberg's work, which is so important to provide us with the record of the past, um, is, is our way of pushing back against the complacency of uh, of our natures. Uh, let's not be uh, adjusted. Let's be maladjusted, as Dr. King would teach us. So let me now thank all of you. You, Dr. Greenberg, you, Rabbi Berg, you, Reverend Warnock. Uh, we appreciate your participation in this conversation. We all have Zoom fatigue, right? And you've <laughs> taken time from your busy schedules to be with us. 
And all those of you who are listening and have been listening to us, we're grateful to you as well for putting this webinar on your schedule. And the AJA, I promise, will continue to sponsor periodically these topical and educational webinars. So watch for the announcements and do join us. Uh, I also have to thank, again, the Temple and also the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center here in Cincinnati for all of the things that they've done to help make this a successful webinar. And of course, to the amazing staff and administration of the AJA, in particular, Lisa Frankel, who for the past two decades have made innumerable contributions to our effort. Please remember friends that the uh, recording of this webinar will be on the HUC portal and also on the website of the National Underground Freedom Railroad Center in uh, beginning tomorrow. And with that, as sorry as I am to have to bring this to an end, we will. And I wanna thank Dr. Greenberg, Rabbi Berg, Dr. Warnock, and all those who are listening. We say to you, goodbye, shalom, and look forward to being with you again in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.